Music is many things. It is entertainment, obviously, but it can also be a political statement, a love letter, or even a tool for education. One thing that music isn't, or rather you'd think the artist wouldn't want it to be, is boring. That, however, is not the case for the subject of today's video. A man who deliberately set out to write boring and repetitive music, and in the process became one of the most influential French composers of the late 20th century. Eric with a C, Alfred Leslie Sarty, who signed his name as Eric with a K Sarty after he rose to fame, for some reason, I guess, was born in Normandy, France, on the 17th of May, 1866, although he did have heritage which traced back to Scotland. When Sarty was four, his family moved to Paris, which in the late 1800s was a hub of artists and musicians, a scene Sarty would find himself deeply ensconced in during his musical career. Sadly, however, his first stint in Paris did not last long, as his mother passed away in 1872, and Sarty and his younger brother were sent back to Normandy to live with his paternal grandparents. This is where he got his first lessons in music from the local organist. Unfortunately, young Sarty's life will be struck with a tragedy again, as at the age of only 12, his grandmother died, and once again, the brothers were shipped back to Paris to be reunited with their father. Sarty's musical education continued in 1879 when he went entered the Paris Conservatoire, where his teachers labelled him untalented. Okay, while this may be a harsh criticism for such an influential musician, it is noted that his professor, Georges Matthias, stated that Sarty's pitfalls lay in his piano playing and he was indeed a competent composer. He was eventually sent home, however two and a half years later he would be readmitted. Alas, his second stint was no more successful, and as such, Sarty decided eh, a military career would probably be more fitting for himself. Sarty, though, not a man to seem to be able to stick to any one thing for very long, was discharged from the army after only a few months when he deliberately infected himself with bronchitis. Sarty then moved to his father's residence in Montmartre, a large hill in Paris where the Basilica of the Sacre Coeur sits. However, in the late 19th century, it was just as notable for the artists that lived and worked in the area, due to its low rent and subsequent attraction due to the possibility of living amongst your contemporaries. As well as Sarty, Picasso, Van Gogh and Toulouse-Lautrec, among so many others, were known to live or work in Montmartre. It's here where Sarty would have his first compositions published by his father. See, Sarty is noted to have taken a lot of influence from his bohemian companions, even in his very first compositions. But before looking at these specific compositions, I think it's worth investigating what work his contemporaries were doing and how this may have influenced and led Sarty to his distinctive style. See, whilst it wasn't a full movement yet, the artists were paving the way for what would become the avant-garde, works of experimental or unorthodox art in all forms which played a large part in the countercultural motion of many artists in the late 19th and 20th century. The term avant-garde was first used in context by Saint Simeon Olinde Rodriguez in his essay The Artist, The Scientist, The Industrialist in 1825. In this work, Rodriguez calls on artists to serve as the people's avant-garde, which translates from French as advancing guard. Um, essentially, he was invoking the artist to provide the work that will aid the people in their social revolution. Whilst avant-garde and modernism in general can often be written off by people as nonsensical, sometimes its beauty can come within its complexity, or in the case of Sarti, its simplicity. Consider both symbolism and minimalism. Whilst one may be simple, at times uh, just a piece of square architecture, or famously a plain blue canvas, the other may be a complex and beautiful oil painting. However, as many meanings can be pulled from both, depending on your viewpoint. If you simply see the blank canvas as that, then you're missing out on so many ideas. It could be a statement on futility. Uh, it could be a message about complexity. The meaning is in the eye of the beholder, and that's the point of these simple pieces. This is something that Sarti himself believed in strongly, which can be seen in one of his earliest and most famous compositions, the Gymnopodies. Apologies about my pronunciation. The title itself comes from the French form of a Greek word for an annual festival where young men dance naked, a title it's believed Sarti chose as a comment on his bare, stripped-back music. The three short pieces which make it up use mild harmonies with performance instructions to play the piece painfully. The pairing of these instructions with simple progressions evoke a real melancholic feel, achieving in only two chord progressions an atmosphere less composers can't reach in an entire opera. Maybe it's not all bad news though for Sarti, as in 1893 he fell in love with Suzanne Valadon, an artist who he even proposed to after just their first night together. Unfortunately the two did not marry. Sarti though became infatuated by Valadon, but 
Unfortunately, she never returned the favour, and just six months after their meeting, she moved away, leaving Sati heartbroken. Sati never had another intimate relationship after this, and in his own words, spent the rest of his life with his head filled with emptiness and his heart filled with sadness. He never commented on whether this heartbreak influenced his later choices in composition. However, personally, I would say his comments on feeling empty would definitely influence his choice to create the empty, minimalist sound he would become famous for. On that note of the minimalism, I think it is time to address the claim I made in the title that Sarty deliberately made music to be boring. See, Sarty is credited as the creator of furniture music, sounds designed to be heard but not listened to. Sarty coined the term himself in 1917, and whilst we refer to it as furniture music, a more literal and possibly fitting translation could be furnishing music, as the pieces are often used as background music to fill a room with ambient sound, to avoid awkward silences, whilst not drawing away from any conversations being had. And whilst lounge pianists and the like may play music like this, the difference is they often play mellow compositions of more extravagant pieces, whereas furniture music is purely written to achieve this non-assuming sound. Sarty may have coined the term himself, but he only actually attributed it to five short pieces, only one of which is known to have been performed publicly in his life. For many years, the music went unappreciated, until American composer John Cage revived interest in furniture music as part of his theory of minimalist music. Cage led to the use of furniture music as a launch pad to more minimalist and experimental music, as Sarty's work was the first instance of the use of music not as a centrepiece, but more of a cerebral backdrop. For this role, boring music is perfect, as if it was too interesting, it would draw away from the other four experiments involved in appreciation of the piece as a whole. Sarty's most famous work, which shows off his dazzling desire for the dull, is Vexations, a musical work Sarty most likely wrote in either 1893 or 1894, which went unpublished in his lifetime. It is believed to have been conceived for the piano, however it is not specified. The piece consists of just one sheet of music covered in impractical enharmonic notation, making it incredibly difficult to sight read. Most bizarre about this piece, however, is the notation at the top, which loosely translated reads, in order to play the theme 840 times in succession, it would be advisable to prepare oneself beforehand, and in deepest silence, by serious immobilities. And if you're not sure what that means, uh, don't worry, <laughs> experts aren't either. However, it's been taken to mean that that one sheet of music should be repeated 840 times for a proper performance to be take place as Sarty envisioned. That would take roughly 19 hours to perform. How do I know this? Because John Cage himself put on a performance of Vexations in 1963. He charged $5 a ticket, however every 20 minutes the audience stayed there, they were refunded 5 cents. It was a bonus for any that made it to the end. Which one person actually did? Again, the music here is thought to deliberately be designed to be boring in this instance, chosen by Cage to make a statement on the lengths people will go to for money or simply satisfaction. The piece was performed by a relay of pianists, swapping out at set intervals, and whilst it was the first performance of Vexations to be completed, it was not the first time it was attempted. Many pianists have attempted to complete it beforehand, but complained after too many repetitions that were having hallucinations or even feeling faint, and some, after having played the repetition hundreds of times, suddenly found themselves unable to remember the melody, just due to the sheer mundaneity of it. It is thought that one of the reasons Sarty wrote Vexations was an act of defiance against Wagnerism and the extended operatic pieces the man was composing. It was his way to prove that he could make an extended piece that people would listen to without the needing the intensity that could be found in Wagner's operas. Sarty believed he could create a better atmosphere with his repetition than Wagner created his con using his continuously modulating progression of complex chords. Sarty continued his endeavours in music through some ups and downs, eventually passing away from cirrhosis at the age of 59. He wrote in his distinctive minimalist style up to his death, and whilst a lot of his appreciation came posthumously, he was still well respected in his time, and will forever be remembered for being able to make more interesting music from simple repetitive melodies than most people could make in a lifetime. So that's it for our video today. I hope you enjoyed learning about this interesting take on music. If this is something you've enjoyed, please leave a like and subscribe. And if there's a demand, I may do a video about the people who write music which is deliberately unpleasant to listen to. Or maybe those that use maths rather than harmonics in their writing. Also, comment below what you think about minimalist music and Sarte in particular. Was he a genius? Or were people just buying into the lunacy of the idea? Otherwise, have a brilliant day and I'll see you in the next one.